Look at this beautiful view. Bob Long, Nancy McIntosh, you guys rock. Thank you for letting us be here tonight. We're not leaving. We're all going to sleep over. That's right. Thank you. Thanks for everything. Okay, here we go. Hey, this thing works. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for part two of the, um, I think this is the first time that Winapalooza has had this educational component, this awareness component. So we're delighted to all be part of that, although Winapalooza has a nice long history. But this is the first time we've kind of done some enlightenment while we're also enjoying the environment, the wine, the food, and of course, getting teed up for tomorrow. Um, I'm the moderator of, the f of this now food panel we're about to have. I'm Brian Cooley, editor-at-large at CNET, and most importantly are my panelists, and they are going to be discussing sort of a, um, a lack of synchronization, we think, between the innovation and the awareness and the ethical mindset of the wine world, which we just heard plenty about, and kind of a disconnect between that and the food world, and how we're going to try and sort those out in the tangible future. This is not, wouldn't it be nice if, this is, it's being done now. And that's what I think is so exciting about it. So here's my panel. Uh, on your left, on the far side, is Tamira Dyson. Tamira is the founder of Soli Vegan. Uh, out of Oakland to LA to Las Vegas, a West Coast phenomenon in really great vegan cuisine. Uh, next to her is Aaron Gort, who joins us from, and needs no introduction, Miyoko's Creamery. And Aaron is social media and community manager there for Miyoko. And then sitting next to me here is Maya Kiri, who is the media and communications manager for the Good Food Institute. And GFI is uh, it's a hub of where food innovation is happening between corporate engagement, between science and tech innovation, and between policy and regulation. It's the number one clearinghouse in terms of how all this stuff comes together. So. Um, let me start everyone off with just a quick snapshot. Tell me what you bring. We know who you are, all three of you. Tamira, tell me what you bring in terms of POV, in a nutshell, to what we're about to talk about. Yeah, definitely. So obviously from the restaurant perspective, you know, I launched Soli Vegan in 2006. Our first brick and mortar, our flagship, launched in 2009. So that was definitely kind of a far stretch from when veganism was not only, you know, not understood, but definitely not welcome to those who did understand it. So I'm coming from a restaurateur perspective, also a vegan myself, and then also from the food science perspective. At Soli Vegan, we make all our own cheeses, vegan meats, sauces, et cetera, you name it, whatever we serve, we make. Um, I have to understand it. Once I understand it, then I create it, and then that's what we serve. So I'm just coming from that perspective of completely believing in what I do. Just that. Just that. <laughs> just that. <right. laughs> just a okay. few things. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now we uh, bring it to you, Aaron. And Miyoko's, of course, needs no introduction. What point of view do you want to get across from what she and that company has established? Yeah, I think, I mean, we are a plant milk creamery brand, so we're working with cheeses and butter. And I think it's one of those things that is very much the final frontier. It's this thing that people have a lot of assumptions about and a lot of hesitancy towards. And I think it's one of those things where we're able to provide someone a different experience. And I think that's one of the more exciting things happening in the food space. And notice she said creamery, which is interesting. Repositioning the idea of what a creamery is. And plant milk. From being tied to animals. Yeah, I like the use of that term. Uh, Tamira has a restaurant chain. Mm -hmm. Miyoko's makes cheeses. Maya, you're sitting kind of in an organization that looks and connects all of this DNA. What point of view do you bring from GFI? Um, yeah, so like I've realized that this is the Australian chair, apparently. <laughs> um, right, right. <laughs> and at least like you have to have like one Australian on a panel, like you know, right. of any panel. It's like if you're trying to sell cars, you got to have one British salesman because yes, they just yes. fall for that accent. Yes, I'll buy oh, it. The sure. accent. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, with the Good Food Institute, we really focus on the next generation of um, plant-based meats. Meat made from um, uh, plants, uh, meat grown directly from cells, and meat made via fermentation. So really, the next generation of um, proteins made in a different way. And we really focus on advancing the science of the space to get these products as as tasty, um, the texture um, perfect, and the price right. Um, so we get we focus on advancing the science. We focus on the policy realm, trying to advocate for good 
fair regulation um, and we focus on um, corporate engagement. So getting some of the biggest um, meat and uh, food companies in the world excited about um, these products. So, and I just, I, yeah, I really want to take a moment to say how exciting this space is and also how critical this region is in this world like this is the birthplace of um yeah like of alternative proteins and there's like 80 companies in this area so this is really where it's happening like this this combination of um agricultural and technological innovation has born this bright new industry so it's it's really exciting and it's it's really happening so let's uh let's take that as a snapshot it was uh I've been around here long enough to remember when the 60s was kind of the kernel of innovation. By the 70s, this region was embarrassing Europe, right? Telling the world that you can get as good a wine or better from this region within 10 miles around us or 20, as you thought could only come from European vineyards, full stop. That was a major result of innovation of a different type at the time. Now we're on the cusp, I think, of another era of major innovation. And Maya, you just started to sort of preface that, which is here we are back again in Northern California. What do you three see is going to be the next key thing we have to accomplish to move California forward toward that 1970s moment when it reset expectations about wine then, resets expectations about what great, desirable, aspirational food is? Who's got thoughts on that? Yeah, I, well, I think that obviously the newer generations are definitely more welcoming to the vegan lifestyle and the plant-based lifestyle. But I think, like, you guys are doing a great job here tonight. The food here is excellent. Great execution, flavor, texture. I don't, you know, I mean, I'm a vegan. I'm not missing anything. I don't, I've been a vegan for a long time. But I think just kind of introducing this, I guess, just the food, not even, let's not even go into lifestyle. Let's not even go into, you know, way of life or whatever. Let's just start with good food. I mean, good food is good food. And I think that people welcome that. It creates, it helps to create the atmosphere. Um, you know, obviously aids in the festivities, et cetera. It can be decadent. It can be indulgent. Um, it can be fulfilling. Um, so I think just kind of, I think introducing these options to individuals who may not have given it a chance in a grocery store or maybe, you know, have gone to a vegan restaurant, et cetera, just kind of incorporating uh, vegan options just for people to explore. That's how we did it at Solely Vegan. I wasn't uh, forcing people to come in and enjoy our plant-based Louisiana cuisine, but I said, here, just come and try. You might like it. And we pulled it off. Yeah. (laughs) I think you're, you're touching on a really important point, which is the fact that I think A lot of people, especially I feel like anyone who's in attendance here, is so innately curious about these good aspects of life, about wine, about food. We all are just trying to soak up of it as much as we can. And we're also all on this journey of really trying to be more conscious consumers. We're trying to, you know, have these uh, ethical brands and we're trying to support these brands or make changes in our our food or whatever it is, whether it be for uh, the animals or for your health or for the environment. We all have different motivations. We're all on this journey. And I think we've been really lucky to live um, in wine country here, which is one of the most sustainable wine countries. And we've really been able to have that Uh, translate to our wine glass, but it hasn't really been able to translate to our plate. And I think the reason for that is, is we all kind of have a little bit more of a hesitancy and assumptions around that, around the idea that you're making a sacrifice of something you are going to enjoy, or you're having a lesser than product that is really made from lower quality ingredients or something like that. And I think at Miyoko's, I know at least we are trying to really shift that mindset from something of sacrifice to something of savoring, of being able to enjoy butter and cheeses and all these things we're all obsessed with. And yeah, really getting to have this like artisan experience of a traditional uh, cheese making method paired with the finest plant milks and you're really just getting to have that like enjoyable experience that you want. Maya, what are you hearing as you listen to these two talk about the foods Mm -hmm. from the point of view of that triangle of corporations that either make or retail and regulators that give the thumbs up or thumbs down and the scientists who develop this? What, What are you hearing that relates to this? Oh, so many things. So yeah, many things. Yeah. Which is good news. Guess, yes, yeah. yes, absolutely. I think like to to Aaron's point in particular, like I think in the past maybe the idea of making these conscious 
choices like veganism or, or sort of reducing your meat consumption or, you know, like it, it all focused on an element of sacrifice. And I think that really limited the progress. Like I think veganism and vegetarianism has hovered around the 4% mark. You know, the, the rate of meat consumption keeps going up because people really love meat and it's it's hard to sacrifice. You don't really want to sacrifice. But the really exciting thing is like – um, like born from this region, there's these incredible foods that you're really not um, you're really not needing to sacrifice. You're just having to sort of switch um, your your buying buying habits because really these products are, are meant to like biomimic, really like you know give you the exact same experiences as the conventional product. So I think it's just going to be a matter of um, the science sort of being moved forward um, so that we can really scale these products because right now they are on the market. You know, most of them are on the market. Some of these these are, are coming to market like later this year, early next year. Like they're really cutting edge, but they're still coming. They're still a premium, so um, they're still like sort of an aspirational purchase. So you know, advancing the science so we can scale up, um, get these products to more consumers, um, will be really key um, to yeah, really moving the needle. And I think the really interesting thing too is we it's not because we don't love animals and it's not because we don't feel this pressure of everything happening to our planet. It what is creating this hesitancy in um, changing what we do to our plates? Really so this this is a very this is a very smart forward thinking room. It's not the best place to do a straw poll. But if I was in a room of just people who just love wine without a predisposition to have come here through Jameson, and I were to say, how many of you are hearing all this and say, okay, that all sounds good, but all those cheeses and sausages and burgers sound like sacrifice, I've heard, lesser than, replacement. Some people use the F word, fake. Yeah, I was going to say quote unquote fake. Fake, right. And you hear a lot of that. That is, is still a barrier to people who have an extremely uh, a, a refined palate and appetite for premium mm. beverage and wine. And then they say, why am I going to have the wine that's up here and pair that with the food that they think is a notch down here just to do the right thing. And so we end up with this, we can you have this disconnect. We've got to level that out. How does that get leveled out? If I so one of the things that I always say when people, you know, talk about, you know, uh, individuals who enjoy, you know, meat products or, you know, live that lifestyle, transitioning over or even considering uh, a plant-based lifestyle, one of the things that I say, and everybody may not like this, but if one comes from a space where you have whole meals, right? You have your protein, you have your starch, you have your vegetables, you eat at certain times a day, you really watch your intake very carefully, right? It, it, you know, as best to your you know knowledge, you do your best. One may not transition from that to a plant-based lifestyle if those plant-based products are not good for you. Um, so I think kind of moving into a territory and understanding that, you know, uh, you know, well, what we do is we create everything, right? But, but I pay attention to all the ingredients. So now these foods are di digestible. They, they aid to your health instead of taking away from it. And so when one kind of considers everything that they eat and they have an eating regimen where they're getting their protein, they're getting their starches, they may not want something that's plant-based that has a lot of, you know, sodium, um, ingredients that are not good for you, ingredients that are not natural. And I think that now the new development of products are paying attention to that. You know, they're using whole ingredients. They're using less, you know, maybe, I don't know, gluten is kind of a, like a taboo these days or whatever. But just kind of um, understanding also uh, that we kind of as innovators, we do have to um, make our, our food approachable, not only in flavor and texture, but also to say this is actually good for you. Aaron, how has Miyoko's avoided becoming labeled, as Tamira's accurately pointing out, as, and I, this is my fervent belief, it is not labeled and not perceived as highly processed, fake, yada, yada. You've somehow navigated away from that, which some other plant-based replacement proteins and foods have gotten stung with. 
Yeah, I think a lot of what has kind of been the vegan world of the past has been all of these super processed products that are just oils and starches and everything like that. And I think Miyoko, who is the founder of our com company, she is uh, a cheesemaker at heart, and she's really just trying to look at all of these true ingredients. Everything is plant milk And first. a French chef by training. Yes. In yes. Tokyo, which is really cool. Cooked the entire... And Julia she's just amazing. <laughs> right. I love her. And that, yes. Girl fan in her. Picture. She cooked the entire Julia Child's cookbook, oh, Vegan. Organized, the entire thing, yeah. She is a foodie at heart, for sure. Um, so yeah, I think it's really just about, she really sought out looking at these plant milks and really learning these true cheese making methods and getting proprietary vegan enzymes and really looking at things that are very true to the process and not trying to <laughs> create things that are used with natural flavors and really trying to mimic these things. It's not about replication, it's about having a unique experience, having mm -hmm. something that is going to give you a, a different a different plate and a different palate experience and I think that's really what she's at her core trying to do. Maya, there is, uh, you just, I want to come back to this, you just uh, kind of foreshadowed the next wave, which is we know plant-based meats, we know a little less about fermented, let's bookmark that for a minute, but you mentioned cultivated and or cultured, the same word is applied to uh, this idea, what is that? So does, has anyone heard of this this technology, cultivated meat or cultured? A few, or, or but not too many. Okay. And a, a less less desirable word, lab grown meat, is what we try to. Uh, How many of you know it as lab grown meat, test tube meat? You've heard that. Okay, the word is cultivated <laughs> slash cultured. So this is this is super exciting stuff, and this is this is the whole reason I'm here today. I remember back in 2015 hearing about this technology and just going. Oh my goodness! Like, so this is this is a technology where um, they're able to take um, a biopsy um, from a live animal without the need to to harm it, um, and they're able to pop that cell, the cells that they've they've isolated, into a nutrient bath and feed it all the things that it would be fed inside the animal, and they're able to actually grow select pieces of um, of meat. Um, without the need to, to to kill any animal, but also because you're not growing a um, um, a full live creature with feathers and hooves and you know like the it's it's incredibly efficient. So you're having to use far less water, far less land, um, and and really it, it it's just for me when I heard that I was like, if you could have the exact same meat, but just not kill an animal and if you can help the environment uh, at the same time like that's that's so incredibly exciting and also just thinking like if this is happening in Silicon Valley if there's you know like there's some so this is like super exciting stuff it's going to attract the world's most um, brilliant innovators which it has like people have given up careers in cardiology and you know like in diplomacy to come to the, the Bay Area in particular this is really where it's happening um, to work on this but and so that's the that's the thing that I sort of um, pre previewed earlier. It's the holy grail, right? It's the holy grail. Growing meat from meat instead of growing meat from a sufferer. And hopefully, um, in on the market in the US this year. That's soon. Wow. And I think that's where this um, group will be particularly important because these products are going to come to market at a premium price mm -hmm. point. They'll be very exclusive, um, prepared by the best chefs. You know, like and. That um, that adoption curve, like you will all be critical to, you know, seeing this sort of technology take take root, um, because it, it won't be accessible to everyone for for a little while, maybe about five ten years. So, but really, when it when it it, it um, is on the market at scale, I just think like that's a profound. That's that's a whole new day for for meat. Um, yeah. And so note that one of the one of the innovators in this, arguably the lead innovator in the U.S. Upside, is who you're mentioning. Uma Valetti was a cardiologist, and he said, "What we know about science and cells, and what I know separately about pharma and how it grows and produces drugs, that's all set up and ready to go to create meat, real meat from meat." It's not any sort of a shortcut. It is the real thing. It just goes through a different path to become that. And uh, they, he said, how do I get this across? I can make this stuff in a faraway plant, 
and I can package it up in the cellophane and the styrofoam tray and all that and all, and make it look identical, but there's something missing. And he took a page from the wine country. And if you go down to Emeryville, he opened this up about, I think, only a few weeks ago for tours. They have something called the EPIC, the Engineering Product and Innovation Center. And they are a wine country experience. It's a, it's, a, it's a laboratory in Emeryville right across the bay from San Francisco. And you go through the production process just like you would do at a winery. You'll see a bunch of stainless steel equipment. You won't see any oak vats, right? You don't, you don't grow meat in oak vats, but you do see the stainless steel of a, of a white wine line, right? Like a brewery. It'll look uh, like, like a brewery. Like a brewery is what yeah. it really looks like. A, yeah, a really advanced brew pub. And then you go into a beautiful kind of a mid-century modern tasting room. And then you do that same experience. A page taken right out of this part of the world. Because it's all about not just what did we do, but how did we get there, and you can be a part of the story by being able to experience it and then go tell others. But as I'm thinking about that, I'm thinking about you, Tamira, and all the pride you have in making everything from scratch. Is there a point at which you either love or push back at cultivated meat? Because you wouldn't be making that. You would be purchasing that and saying, you know, at some point, yeah, I'm going to buy meat again and put it into my food. So I wouldn't do that. And why And why not? I wouldn't do that. Um, again, I'm a vegan myself. I don't consume meat. And so what I do, Solely Vegan for me is not just a business. It's what I believe in. And with that being said, it's not, I don't go out and try to force people to live that lifestyle. I just mm -hmm. offer them a great meal that happens to be vegan, you know, completely plant-based. You, I, you know, I heard of this, obviously. I think it's extraordinary. And I think that people go vegan for many reasons, you know, um, some for health, some can't, you know, you know, digest whatever. And then a lot of people go vegan for animal cruelty reasons. So, I mean, that's, you know, I, I guess a result for that. I still have to kind of wrap my head around it it's and learn process, more right? about it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I understand kind of, you know, what you're saying, but for me to kind of dive in, just wrap my head around it, just something that I, I want to do. But I don't foresee myself adding it to my menu. Though. Okay, but this is going to be great. I love to, to create. That would be take great, away and, me and that's a key part. But it'll be that. great to stay in touch with you over the next year, <laughs> two, three years, as this whole landscape evolves, and see you're what right your thinking about that. is and how you view it. Yeah, because you're an innovator yeah. and you have your you have your fingers on the pulse of people that are at restaurant level. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I look forward to seeing this, you know, how this evolves. And I just, you know, I, I, don't, I, don't, I just, I thought it was extraordinary. But so I'm just looking forward to seeing the development. It was interesting. I went down to, um, I, I got a preview of, it was Impossible Pork right before it went on market. We went down, me and a colleague of mine who happens to be Muslim. And so she went with me. So this is interesting. And her angle on the story was, can I eat this? Now, this is a plant-based company. No cultivated nothing. No animals and animal cells are involved anywhere. But it's, quote, pork. So pork is both a thing, a fiber, a meat. Pork is also a concept. And what she found out, in, uh, she did taste it. She didn't feel good about tasting it, just like you're reacting to, <laughs> I'm not sure about this cultivated meat. It's still meat. Yeah. Even though the animal cruelty is out, the health maybe can be engineered a little better. And, uh, and then she talked to uh, her imam, and they came away with, the, with the, uh, the opinion that, yeah, I love it, I get it, but I'm not going to eat it. So there's a whole lot of interesting cultural sorts of things and heritage and previous conception factors that we all experience, and we're kind of up on this. Imagine the average consumer. I think there's also a really interesting shift within vegans themselves. I think a lot of the uh, conceptions around who vegans are, are these, you know, scary, crazy people who are <laughs> throwing red paint on you or doing all of these very intense things. And I think, I mean, yes, we're very passionate people, but <laughs> um, I think there's also a shift. Just wear a raincoat. You'll be fine. <laughs> Don't wear white. Um, <laughs> so when you think about the idea of these Beyond Meats or Impossibles or these different brands that are kind of bringing these um, alternative options, you're really looking at something that's um, kind of able to present and offer these options to people who are looking for something that's very similar. And you're also able, I think we as vegans are kind of trying to shift our mindset and really be a lot more welcoming in terms of knowing that there's a space and that's that should exist and always have its space and we like we're happy i mean it means more people are being able to embrace this lifestyle whether it be through flexitarian or completely vegan i mean what well, one more beyond meat burger is well you know one less animal burger so that's the kind of way i i like to look at it 
And I think the newer vegans are um, kind of less worried. About, honestly, they're less worried about health necessarily, more so kind of sustainability and, you know, um, environmental issues, etc. So, I mean, I could <laughs> kind of see this being a thing to those people who, you know, because I mean, Lay's chips are vegan, there's Oreos are vegan. So, I mean, a lot. I'm just being honest, like a lot of people are not vegan just for health purposes, you know, they're vegan because or whatever their personal reasons are. So this could solve, you know, a lot of areas where people might tread over if they don't see that it's destroying or, you know, hindering our planet or, you know, stuff. And so I want to spend some time on this particular topic because it is, it gets us to the point of here is a steak to go with your beautiful <laughs> aperture red. Dan was educating me a few minutes ago. Dan Casey. Um, and you end up with... Uh, the real thing, if you will. And we suddenly can then get around the alt-meat thing, which I think is going to be an area of inflection for a wine and food crowd, not counting this very aware wine and food crowd in some cases. Um, let me, uh, let's finish up with our last few minutes here and talk about uh, what you'd like to see each of you to see happen next in, the next in the next year or so from your various points of view as a restaurateur, a creamery, a clearinghouse, what do you see as, uh, Maya, let's go to you. What, do you. what are you guys working on that you'd like to see knocked down that is in the realm of trying to elevate and harmonize great food and wine with ethical, responsible food? And protein. Just, just a small question there. Yeah, nothing, yeah, nothing a there. a small yeah. question. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'll give you about two seconds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think, you know, 2022 <laughs> is going to be like a really critical year. We've got COP26 has just happened, COP27 coming up. You know, climate is front and centre. Also, at the same time, like, you know, as Carlos said before, like, meat and um, agriculture is responsible for, like a, um, like, a third of climate emissions, and yet meat production is going to increase about, like, 70% by 2050. So, like, it's sort of like there's, there's an urgency um, of the need to switch up the way we're making protein just because... There's not enough land on the planet for us to be able to make 70% more meat. Like, so that these sort of options are going to be really vital moving forward. So there's a lot of innovation that has to happen in a very small amount of time. So I think it's um, support from governments, you know, to fund, um, you know, R&D and to, you know, advancing these technologies. I think it's sort of, um, you know, people like yourselves, like being open to trying and mm -hmm. testing and, you know, like giving feedback to these companies. Like, is this is this, you know, scratching the itch? Is this, is this like sort of meeting the, um, you know, the, the caliber that you expect for, you know, your, the meat experience? So there's a lot of different things, but um, I, I think there's a lot to be excited about. But what I would just say is that these products, plant-based meat, like Impossible and Beyond, cultivated meat, these are for meat eaters. These, this, is, this is in recognition that not everyone's going to go vegan. These people love meat. People want to eat more of meat. So it's sort of like how do we give people the meat that they love but just made in a, a way that's a bit more gentle on the planet and that we can make much more of it much more efficiently. Erin? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I kind of have two. So I think uh, what I'm kind of thinking about in the future um, is this idea of really embracing this a journey of if – if in wine country we're all local vores, the idea of really embracing this idea of craft and artisan and all of these different aspects of our life and really looking for products that align with our core values and do all these things. And I think one of the most interesting things that I've been curious about is um, pizza. And this is going to throw, throw we're everything We're all curious off. about pizza, so that's okay. <laughs> Well, Don't let me apologize. tell you, <laughs> people are pizza obsessed. And I think it's one of these foods that is just so bonding between everyone. And I think one of the interesting things I Quick poll, learned... pizza haters. That's what <laughs> I thought. No one. Yeah. Okay. Get uh, out of here. <laughs> and I think one of the interesting things I've learned is uh, pizza is one of the main sources of cheese consumption. It's uh, really heavily where um, the dairy industry is relying on is mozzarella. And I think hmm. we, we've come out of Miyoko's with a, a liquid mozzarella that's able to kind of create a really craft artisan cheese and give you the experience you want um, for pizziolas or chefs or you're just your average pizza lover. 
And I think it's a really interesting shift to watch people experience that and know that it could create such a massive impact. I mean, it's 98% less greenhouse gas emissions, which, I mean, you think one pizza, it's, that's insane to me. And the other thing too I'm excited about is finding these really unique solutions um, to these other problems that the shift is causing. So. I think one of the things is agriculture. We, especially here, we see agriculture all around us. And I think when you're thinking about adjusting, if we're looking at changing um, dairy farms and we're looking at kind of transitioning these farms and we're transitioning what we eat away from cheese, what happens to these dairy farms? And what happens to these like family run years of history of these people? And I think we really do have to think about them. And um, I think what's really interesting is Miyoko has actually launched a program, um, a dairy farm transition program that's actually able to um, consider these farmers and partner with them and help them make this transition and support them along the way as they transfer to actual crops that are able to then be worked into our um, products and our product line. And I think that's such a really creative and in, like innovative way to look at not just leaving them in the dust and leaving them to, to suffer without like any work or anything to do with our heritage and really be able to have them come along in this journey with us. And if you haven't tried the mozzarella oh. that Aaron's talking about, it's crazy. Mine it pours mine. out like kefir out of a jaw, out of a bottle and then it firms up into mozzarella. That's some weird magic. I don't even want to know how you did that. That's like almost scary how well that works. Okay, Tamira, you get the last word. What's uh, what's on your list of tough nuts to crack in the year ahead? <laughs> just kind of, you know, just making, you know, vegan options just more accessible. Events like this just kind of up your offerings, diversify your offerings, so to speak. Uh, you spoke about Impossible. We just catered for Impossible again and we they wanted us to use their their ground beef and I made a lasagna with our mozzarella cheese or whatever. So, I mean, and that was just incredible. It was really delicious. But just kind of, you know, up in the, diversifying your offering, so to speak, giving, you know, vegan options just a chance. Um, and I'm sure you'll be pleasantly surprised that, you know, the food can be just, you know, so very delicious. And for myself, when I would have company and entertain, et cetera, long before Solely Vegan, when I was in the medical field, um, I worked at Marin General Hospital for about 10 years in the surgery center endoscopy department specifically. Uh, but when I used to entertain, I would have individuals over my house. And of course, I didn't tell them that they were eating vegan food. They would just gobble it all up. And then by the time they were leaving, I said, hey, well, you know, everything was vegan. And they were just surprised. They were just like, oh, my God. I, and my son ate this and et cetera. So just kind of, Were they you ever know, pissed? They weren't pissed. Okay. They weren't. They, sometimes they, were totally they feel like you pull okay. the wool over their eyes. Like you're no, playing a game. Yeah. Good food is good food. That's you right. know, good That's food right. is good food. That's right. So, you know, just kind of, you know, just making it more accessible, diversifying your options, just to explore. We all love to explore. That's it. And think you how know. much though the DNA of what you're hearing here is part of what you've uh, what you embrace and what you've gone what you've gone through in your in your journey as a wine lover. Listen to all the keywords you've heard. Explore. Innovate. Innovate doesn't mean phones and microchips. Innovate means innovate, right? Technology is not electronics. Technology is how we get things done better tomorrow than today. That's what technology is. It's nothing to do with Samsung and Apple. So think about how you want to embrace technology in that sense, how you want to innovate, how you want to see tomorrow today. Whatever way you want to look at it, know that you are exactly in the place that's going to see it first and spread the religion sooner. So we need you all to continue to do what you're already doing. And avoid the V words. Never call yourself vegan or vegetarian. Those are dead names now. People have people have put those in a weird box and they immediately think, uh, mm, uh. Plant -based. Just Plant -based. say, I love this. Yeah. So I want to thank our panel. Please give me a hand for Tamira, Aaron, and Maya.